blessed name. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for being able to bring us together to worship your name, to praise you, to being in this body of believers, to being in this house today, to be able to worship you. Father, I pray for this service today. I pray that your word is here, that your people, that, that as your people, that we are able to have hearts to hear your word today. I pray for our speaker today, Courtney, that you bring a word, that you bring the truth. Father, that we have the ears to hear your truth and that we are able to take that truth and that it pours into our lives and we are able to pour in others as well. Father, we thank you. We praise you for your, for your mercy and for your triumph on the cross. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to Meridian Baptist Church. It's so great to be here in the house of the Lord this morning. Amen. Amen. You can go ahead and take a seat. Thank you. Uh, we're going to go ahead and begin with our weekly scripture challenge verse. Um, there are a lot of words on the screen, and I cannot read it from here, so I'm going to be turning around to read it, but you're going to read along with me, right? And then don't forget that we want to apply this to our life as we go out and interact with one another and, and reach out to those who are in our lives and in our circles of influences, okay? So if you'll read along with me. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Psalms 23, 1 through 6. Amen. Amen. What a great verse to read this morning and to just meditate on throughout the week because you know what this really says is that God is going to be there with us through all of the challenges in our lives. Amen. He's going to comfort us and he's going to protect us like a shepherd does the sheep. Amen. Uh, we want to connect with you. We would love it if you would fill out the connection card and drop that off in the offering. Uh, just if you have any new information, fill that out on the front. If this is your first time visiting, uh, you can fill out any information you're comfortable sharing with the church. If you have any prayer requests that you would like to have the church pray for, and that's what we're here for, fill that out on the back and we'll gladly pray for you. If you would like it to be anonymous, go ahead and circle the little questionnaire because this list does go out to everyone here at the church. And if you'd like to be a part of the people who receive that list so you can pray along with the church, go ahead and just put a smiley face somewhere on the card, the front or the back, and uh, Miss Jeanette or whomever is handling the cards this week will be sure to know what that means, okay? Amen. Uh, we'll go ahead and continue with worship this morning. So if you'll stand um, as we prepare the next song, go ahead and greet one another and we'll continue. Thank you. Hey, y'all. Well, good morning again to you great and lovely people. Good morning. Word. It's our prayer time. All times are our prayer time. However, this time has been set aside in our time of worship for maybe doing a little reflective thinking. Maybe there's something in your heart that you have been bothered with or bothered by, and you want to just leave it with the Lord. That's what these times are for. It's not just a format and a service or a ceremony, and this is just a time for Pastor Gary or Brother Ed or whomever to get up and just share a prayer. This is time for your involvement to engage your Heavenly Father on just some certain particulars in your heart that may or may not be bothering you. And this is also a time for giving praise, for allowing yourself to worship your Lord and Savior with a simple thank you. I am sure the Lord has blessed you and has done great things for you. 
some of which we may have even taken for granted. But to say thank you without asking for anything sometimes is necessary. Now, having said that, which was not in the program, <laughs> our scripture of today is uh, out of John 15 and 3, and it says, you are already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. But I want to read a few more verses in order to give context of that particular scripture. So if we go to John 15, beginning at verse 1, it reads, excuse me, the word of the Lord reads, I am the true vine. And my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must Remain in the vine, neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. The very words of God, may the Lord add a blessing to the reading and hearing of his word. The key verse there is you are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. What makes us clean? The presence of the Lord inside of us. Jesus Christ is what makes us clean. It's nothing that we do. There's nothing in and of ourselves. It is a blessing from God that you are clean as you serve him and are a part of that global body of Christ. Amen? Amen. Our emphasis is to, just as Jesus' first disciples were made clean because of the word which Jesus spoke to them, we are to pray that our church family will, will submit to the word of God, a pruning tool God still uses in cleansing his branches from sin. The word of God will cut like a knife, splitting soul and spirit and all those other things. But what becomes necessary for us to see here and understand is it, that is, if the Lord is speaking to you through his word, You've got something to do. There's an action for you to engage in. And the greatest pruning tool that God uses is love. Amen? Amen. All right. So now we're going to do, like I said in the early service, we're going to do what my mother always tells us to do, and that is to look to the Lord. Let's pray. Gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we, your children, come before you, Father, and admit, Lord, uh, to your majesty, to your almighty power. And we know, Father, that you are indeed a father who cares, a father who looks over your children, even though we are not worthy, and that indeed we do know. But because of Christ, there is some worth to us. And in so being that, Father, we just thank you for setting aside a, a path of us to be reconciled to you and a path for us to engage you, Father. Our emphasis here is to producing, is producing fruit and also to understand that your pruning tool, your word, is what will help us to produce more fruit. We can be fruit inspectors of each other, but Father, we really got enough on our own to worry and be concerned about ourselves. But we do know, Lord, that your word tells us to go and make disciples. We do so by how we act with each other, how we communicate with each other, even within our neighborhoods and communities that, you know, how, how we are exampled and an example for others to see. We often say that you might be the only Bible someone reads, and that's true. So, Father, as we're producing fruit, Father, let's first begin with producing good fruit at home. 
Let's produce great fruit within our own congregation, and then we can branch out to produce fruit other places, Father. I know, Lord, that that might, might sound a little weird, but it is indeed a concern for me personally, is that we are indeed a fellowship that loves one another. We come together to love each other and to provide a blessing to our communities outside of these walls. It's not always about what happens inside, but what happens outside of these walls to bring glory to you, to bring praise to you, and to worship you. So, Father, help us to do that, and help us to do that in love, because God is love. His word is given to us because he loves us, and Lord, we thank you for that. So, Father, we know that there are those who are watching and worshiping with us today. We are lifting up prayers for them in their homes and, and, and their families and whatever issue that they may have at heart. There are other issues of heart that are here inside this facility. And then, Father, we know, Lord, that you need to minister to each and every one of us. So we're praying for the issues of heart for you to minister to them. And collectively, Father, you continue to minister to us. All that we can say or do is not enough to say thank you because you have really blessed us as a body of believers. You have blessed us individually. You have blessed our families. You have watched us and crossing some streets and, and doing some things that we may not should have done. But you've covered us. That and indeed in and of itself is a blessing that you have given us. Help us not to take it for granted. Help us to consider all that we do to have you, Father, produce a big Kool-Aid smile to your children here. And then, Father, we lift up, as always, our pastor. We pray for him and his family. We pray for the ministry that he has responsibility for and answering to you. That's a huge responsibility. So we pray for him and his sustenance and his, his ability to be here and to do the things that he needs to get done to bring praise and worship your name. And then we lift up our brother, Courtney, who is going to produce a word that you've given him to share with us. We believe in your word, Father, and just ask, Father, that you would anoint his mind, his speech, and the word that you're giving him when he's up here, that it may be even outside of his notes, that he would preach your word and do the things that you have called for him to do this day for these, your people. Holy Spirit. It is not me to say have your way, but I will say that because it's all about you and the triune God. Bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Gary, for leading us in our, in our intercessory prayer time. Always great to when you lead us and those. So we'll let the children go out to to worship uh, at their own level. They're not going out to play. They're going out to worship at their level. And no, you can't go out and get cookies and punch. And refreshments that they might get, we'll give you something afterwards. Amen. I, I know. I know that's some. Well, that, I shouldn't say that. I'm just. I'm thinking to myself. That's what. That's what some of you wish you could get. Brother Courtney, don't stand, don't, don't, don't worry about that. You don't. 
Well, I want to introduce to to you Meridian, um, a brother that I have uh, just this morning gotten to know uh, so much better. We've seen each other from a distance for several years. Um, I, I knew his, I know of his home church, and you've heard me talk about his home church through the years. Uh, he comes from, his home church is the View Church, up in, uh, they're now in Menifee. They were in Temecula and then Marietta and went through several different buildings, and now they're in Menifee, doing a great work. His pastor is uh, Gregory Perkins, who is a, a good personal friend, a dear friend. Uh, in fact, we just rode up to Fresno and back together, and you all know how much I love Bakersfield. Um, we rode through Bakersfield together, so you know that's an accomplishment um, and in and itself. Um, but we did find we did we did come back through um, and and stop just in Bakersfield and went to um, Cracker Barrel. Nothing like fried chicken and gravy and biscuits. Man, I keep talking about food. I'm sorry. But Courtney is the Senior Vice President and Chief Legal Officer of the Baptist Foundation of California. And uh, he is going to not only be our speaker this morning, but he's also going to share after a service uh, about estate planning and, um, and by his title, I'm sure you can imagine that he is a man of letters, uh, law school graduate, and all, of, all that that has to do, passing the bar and practicing law and, um, and all of that. But I, I need to let you know that, um, and I think it might say in your bulletin, Courtney Coates, but it should say... Minister Courtney Coates. And I'll let him tell you about that. But he is still that he's still the senior vice president and chief legal officer of the Baptist Foundation. But I want you to know that he's not just the senior vice president and the chief legal officer. He is a minister of the gospel. Amen. So uh, when I say he's a man of letters, yes. Romans, Ephesians, Galatians. I'm, uh. I just thought of that one, Pastor Gary. Thank you. Uh, but anyway, so he is, Courtney is going to come and he's going to share with us a message I believe that is timely. Uh, as we enter this month of June, this month, the theme for this month in our prayer is abiding in Christ. And uh, I can think of no better example than how we, as Courtney is going to share with you, how we, um, how we honor God in our uh, stewardship. And so, uh, would you welcome with me a brother beloved um, who's from this area originally, um, back to San Diego, Minister Courtney Coates. Well, good morning, Meridian. Good morning. Such a blessing. I'm so humbled. Can I just say that? I'm, I'm just humbled to be here. Your pastor, I've, I've grown to just love as a friend, and we're getting to know each other even more as we spend time together. But I'm just so grateful to be here in the house of the Lord. So grateful to be here on a Sunday morning to share the word of God. I am a minister of the gospel. Um, the greatest title I have, in my view, is just being a child of God. Next to that is being a father and a husband. My wife is here. My, my daughter's here. Stand up, Shelly. Stand up, Elizabeth. They decided to take their trek up to the 15 uh, South or down this 15 South. We live in Temecula and uh, so grateful for them to be with us. But um, God is in this place and he's appointed us for such a time as this to just hear his word. I'm going to speak to you for a few moments this morning about giving God our best. On behalf of the Baptist Foundation of California, I just want to 
Thank you for having us. Um, I am the chief legal officer. We, what we do is we resource churches through investments, through lending. We gave out $32 million in loans last year. We manage over $200 million in, in investments. Uh, but we come alongside churches and we help spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Matthew 28 and 19, what does it say? Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit. And so we come alongside churches to help them get out this great gospel. And he uses each and every one of us to accomplish his work. And so God is going to speak to us today. It's my prayer today that he speaks to us on this principle of giving God our best through the lens and through the eyes of a poor Jewish widow. It's a very familiar passage of scripture found in the gospel according to Mark chapter 12, beginning at verses 41 through 44. I'm going to read this into your hearing. We're going to jump around a little bit with scripture to find out what God's heart is about giving. And then we're going to Focus on this poor Jewish widow, how God uses this widow as an example for each and every one of us to give him our very best. How many want the Lord to say, I'm pleased? Amen. Well done, yes. my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things, and now I'm going to make your ruler over many. So just walk through the scripture with me found in the gospel according to Mark chapter 12. Uh, you have an amazing church, you have an amazing pastor, and he loves the word of God. So we're going to read this into your hearing today. And the word of God reads, And he, Jesus, sat down opposite the treasury and began observing how the people were putting money into the treasury. And many people were putting in large sums. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins which amount to a cent. Calling his disciples to him, he said to them, Truly, I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all of the contributors to the treasury, for they all put in out of their surplus. But she, out of her poverty, put in all she owned, all she had to live on. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and to the hearing of his word. Let us pray. Father, we say thank you this morning for your loving kindness, your tender mercy. We thank you for the opportunity to hear and to study your word. Your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Would you clear out the clutter of our minds today? Would you speak to us now as only you can? Would you allow me to rightly divide your word of truth so that we might eat together and learn from your word. Would you strengthen us, empower us, change our hearts with your word, convict us, receive all the glory, all the honor and the praise today. It's in Jesus' name that we pray and give thanks. And all God's people said, amen, amen, amen. 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 Giving God our best. You know, as we explore this principle of giving, it's important for us to first understand that we cannot possibly outgive God. Amen. For God so loved the world that he did what? He gave. Who did he give? His only begotten son, that whosoever believed on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. When God gave us Jesus, he modeled for us how to give wholeheartedly, how to give his very best to us. For God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. When he gave us Jesus, he gave all of himself to us. And even in this post-pandemic world that we're living in, this economic financial turmoil that we're living in, we can still have that testimony that God is a giver. God is yet faithful. He can, continues to, su to supply all of our needs. He continues to renew his mercy daily in our lives. And for that, he deserves all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. And if, and if there was ever a need 
to share the hope that we have in Christ. It's right here and right now. Amen. Pastor Roland asked me to come and to encourage you today on this principle of giving God our best of our time, of our talents, and our treasure. And let me let you in on a little secret this morning. God owns it all. He owns in an absolute sense, absolutely everything. And we own in an absolute sense, absolutely nothing. Amen. You're ahead of me. <laughs> you know, King, King David was a man after God's own heart, was he not? He owned wealth and had popularity and spheres of influence. But he put this principle of stewardship in its proper context. In Psalm 24, verse 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Our time, our talents, our treasures are some of the most precious commodities that God entrusts us to manage. We don't own it, but we are simply managers of God's goodness and God's blessings. How many are beneficiaries of God's multiple blessings in your relationships, in your finances? The Apostle Peter, in 1 Peter 4 and 10, he put it like this. As each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. You see, we're, we are simply managers, not owners of God's gifts. And as we surrender our hearts to the king more and more, we begin to put him in his proper place. He's no longer next to the NFL or the Major League Baseball or Sports Illustrated or our favorite TV show. But he gets preeminence and takes first place in every area of our lives. As we grow, we will find ourselves more willing to relinquish the most precious things we offer to him. And our transformation to be more like Christ is simply an endeavor to give and to sacrifice just like Jesus gave and sacrifice to the praise and glory of God. What did he say in the Garden of Gethsemane? Not my will, but thy will be done. And so this widow's might narrative in Mark 12 is preceded by Jesus' encounter with the rich young ruler in Mark 10 and if we juxtapose these two passages of Scripture, we will start to see God's heart revealed for the believer in this area of stewardship, in this area of giving. You remember that parable in, or that story in Mark 10 where this rich young ruler was imploring Jesus to allow him to inherit the kingdom of God, to inherit eternal life? He says, good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he said to him, he said to Jesus, teacher, I have kept all these things from my youth up. Jesus, looking at him, felt a love for him and said to him, One thing you lack. Go and sell all you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. But at these words, he was saddened and he went away grieving, for he was one who owned much property. And Jesus, looking around, said to his disciples, How hard it will be for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. You see, this man's heart had been exposed. He had done everything else right from his youth up, but he could not depart from this one thing. He could not depart from his wealth. You see, it's often said, my brothers and sisters, that the last thing that gets saved, the last thing that gets converted when we surrender our hearts to Christ 
when we give our hearts to him, the last thing that gets surrendered to God is this, our wallet, our pocketbook. It's, it's that last stubborn thing that we say, Lord, you can be God over every other area of my life. But this thing, this area of finance, this area of money, I've got this covered. But how many know that God, he wants to be Lord over it all? He wants to have preeminence in every area of our lives. And through this discipline of giving, God wants to expose, just like this rich young ruler, he wants to expose the idols that are in our hearts. What we are unwilling to part with in order to put him in his proper place. Following Christ and making him Lord exposes anything and everything that we are willing to put before serving him. You see, giving and serving others to advance the gospel message is the truest essence of worship. Attending church on Sundays for a couple hours a week, it's good, it's great. But you want to know what truly impresses God? You want to know what truly causes him to smile and say, well done? It's when we surrender to him our whole hearts without wanting anything else in return. What is the best gift that causes God to smile? It's our hearts being fully submitted and committed to him. So we, we, will, we examine Mark 12 and we will learn today how God is impressed not so much by what we give, the size of the gift, but our heart's posture in giving. Because if the heart is right in how we give to God, the what will naturally follow. Let me say that again. See, if the heart is right, in how we give to God, then the what we give, the size of the gift, will naturally follow. So we see here from Mark 12 that giving God our best requires three things. Number one, giving God our best requires that we put our faith into action. Put our faith into action. Secondly, giving our best to God requires that we give sacrificially. And then thirdly, giving our best to God requires that we give with a heart of gratitude for God's grace. And if we are missing any of these key ingredients to giving, then we are missing out on giving God our very best and in turn, missing out on the benefits of a life of complete surrender to him. Let's go to the text in Mark 12, verse 41. It says, And he, Christ, sat down opposite the treasury at the temple and began observing how the people were putting money into the treasury. So we see here first that God, he pays close attention to our heart's posture in giving. After complaining about the hypocrisy of the Pharisees and Verse 38, in their abuse of the widows, Christ then turns and uses the example of a poor Jewish widow to show us the essence of worship. Christ cared so much about this principle of giving that he sat down opposite the treasury and began observing people, young, old, rich, and poor. He cared so much that he calls his disciples over to witness this. Not, not for their own, not just for their own edification, but for you, for me, for an example, a teachable moment for us to learn about God's heart as it relates to giving. Could, could you imagine if Pastor Roland during the offering, I don't know if you guys still pass out offering plans or do in the envelopes, you fill out your envelopes, could you imagine if he came down? He had to watch what you were writing down in your, your checkbook. If he came over and 
walked up the road, looked down the aisle to see exactly what you were getting out of your purse and giving to the church. You would say, Pastor Roland, get out of my purse. <laughs> Pastor Roland, get out of my checkbook. What I give to God, what I give to kingdom work is between me and God. How dare he be so nosy <laughs> and examining just what I'm giving? We get a lot of flack for that. But we see here in Mark 12 that Jesus... He pays close attention. He is sitting down and he's watching us. He knows what's in our bank account. He knows what's in our purse. He knows what's, what idle time we are wasting and not serving him and doing futile things. He knows just how we are stewarding that which he has blessed us with. He's not only the great physician, but Christ is also the great accountant. You may say, Courtney, what I give, how I spend my time, what I do to serve the church is my business. But just like that rich young ruler, our level of giving or lack thereof, it exposes the idols in our hearts. Now, what do we know about the temple treasury here in Mark 12? which was under the law of Moses, we know that the temple treasury was comprised of 13 receptacles that were shaped like trumpets. And everyone came to give their best to the temple because it was expected of them and required of them to take care of all the needs of the temple. It was a legal requirement. And not only were the needs of the temple taken care of, but also the needs of the orphans and the widows, let's pay attention to that. The orphans and the widows were being taken care of through the giving into these receptacles. There was no giving online. There was no texting or PayPal. <laughs> Trumpets one and two were reserved for the half shackle, the temple tribute. They gave money to facilitate the purchase of animal sacrifices. The money was stored in the temple treasury, was expended partly in the purchase of sacrifices also used for incense and the payments of the rabbis and other officials connected with the temple. Trumpet three was money for turtle doves, used for a sin offering. Trumpet four, money for young pigeons. Trumpet five, money for wood, used in the temple. Trumpet six, money for incense. Trumpet seven, money for golden vessels used in the ministry. And if a man had put aside a certain sum of sin offering and any money was left over after its purchase, it was cast into trumpets 8 through 13, money left over for sin offerings. We must understand, brothers and sisters, that the Jews gave money because it was required by Jewish law to purchase and to use animal sacrifices to temporarily cover sin. Forgiveness of sin, accidental sin had to be atoned for. Intentional sin, adultery, murder, blasphemy, incest. The penalty for those sins was death. But somebody says, thank God for Jesus. Thank God for Jesus. But then Jesus came. He came as that perfect, sinless lamb. I believe it was John the Baptist who saw Jesus coming. And what did he say? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And when he took away our sins, he didn't just cover them temporarily. But when he hung between heaven and earth on that cross, he cried out to Telestai, it is finished. I've paid for their sins once and for all. Aren't you glad about it today? So now... We don't have to give. We don't give because it's required to give. It's not out of legalism or out of compulsion that we give. But we give to show our appreciation, our gratitude for God sending his son into this world and taking away our sins once and for all. For while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 
Aren't you glad about it? So what should be our response? Paul, the Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians, Corinthians 9, through 9, verses 6 through 7, He who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart. Not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful, a hilarious giver. And so Jesus' full payment for our sins doesn't mean that we shouldn't give anymore. It's paid in full. I don't have to give anymore. No, no, that's not what it means. But it, what it means is that we have a far better reason to give. And we can give with an attitude that, God, we are thankful for all that you've done in rescuing me, rescuing me from my sin. And he wants us to show our appreciation. And the more we know about him, the more of ourselves we should want to give to him for his glory. Amen. You know, but some of us, my brothers and sisters, some of us are going in reverse. There's a story I was reading about a young man who was doing well in his career and gave his life to Christ. He was on fire for the Lord when he first accepted Christ. And he was giving passionately to his church. He was giving thousands of dollars a month to his church. And over time, as he continued to serve and get immersed in kingdom ministry, his giving began to falter and wane. He was conflicted about this because he was being blessed in his business, doing far better than he did when he first started. So he went to his pastor. He said, Pastor, I, I was giving so much when I was on fire for the Lord. When I first gave my heart to Christ, I was giving thousands of dollars a month. But now my, I'm finding that my, 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 my giving is is faltering. I'm struggling in this area. I'm not giving as much as I used to, even though I'm making more money than I was before. Could you pray for me in this area? Pastor said, sure, brother, I'll pray for you. Father, we thank you for this brother who, in his heart to give. We thank you that you've blessed him in his career, blessed him in his finances, but he's, he's confessed that he's faltered in his giving, and even though he's making more money now than when he first got saved, uh, he's giving less money. So, Lord, I pray right now that you would take him back to when he was making less money than he is now. Pastor, the brother said, Pastor, interrupt. But he interrupted, Pastor, wait a minute. That's, that's not what I meant when I said pray for me. See, my brothers and sisters, some of us are like this young man. We, we're going in reverse. When we first got saved, we first... We're on fire for the Lord. We were giving all that we had. We were giving so much of our time, our talents, our treasures to kingdom work. But as we got immersed in, in ministry and, and began spending more time in church, we've grown complacent. We've lost our fire. We're, we're not giving with the same passion that we did before, even though God has blessed us. What, what is happening what is happening with all of this? It is a principle of the heart. Apostle Peter said, as each one has decided in his heart, the more we get to know God, the more we spend time with him, we, the more we understand the depths of what he's done for us, his love for us, his grace for us. We should be growing in our capacity to give. Somebody say amen. amen. So what is God looking for? He's looking for the right heart posture. He's looking for us to give with the right heart. So we see Christ sat down at the temple to see how the people were giving. Why? Because Jesus admonished his disciples. In Matthew 6, 19, verse, verses 19 through 21, he said, Do not store for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy nor thieves break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there it is. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So when we are able to give of our treasure, instead of keeping things for ourselves, it shows 
that our heart isn't so tied to material things and that God is taking his proper place in our hearts, in our lives. Verse 41 says, Jesus began observing how the people were putting money into the treasury. In other words, we learn from verse 41 what best giving does not look like because we see here that there were rich people putting in large sums of money. Say, what's wrong with that, Minister Coates? Sounds like a good church member to me. Rich people putting in large sums of money into the treasury. What's wrong with that? But we see that Jesus was not impressed by what these rich people were, were, were giving. You see, we can give. We can spend time and money and energy sowing into kingdom work. But we can do all these things for the wrong reasons. Think about that. You can punch a clock on Sunday. You can give of your time, your talents, and treasure. But do all these things for the wrong reasons. Jesus was not impressed by what these rich people were giving because they were giving with the wrong heart posture. We know this because he admonished the people in Matthew 6, 1 through 2. Let's grab that. Matthew 6, he says, Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. So when you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet before you. There it is. As the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be honored by men. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. So we see that they were giving large sums of money, but they were giving for public recognition. And what happens when we give for public recognition, we relegate God to an earthly reward. We get that pat on the back. We get that public recognition, that hand clap, that name recognition. And we have robbed God we have robbed ourselves, essentially, of a heavenly reward. Giving our best to God is humble, is reverent, is designed only to bring glory to God and to God alone. Someone say amen. amen. So giving God our best requires that we give humbly. And it also, we see here from this Jewish widow, it requires that we put our faith into action. What do we know about what happens here? This Jewish widow was not giving because it was required to give. Jewish widows were taken care of. They are receiving the benefits from the temple each and every day. But she was giving in faith that God would take care of her no matter what. Because the, the leaders weren't doing what they were supposed to do. And we see that in verse 38, how they're abusing the widows. But notwithstanding all the political things that were going on, notwithstanding the abuses of the widows, we see that this poor Jewish widow has her faith in God and God alone. And she believes that God is going to take care of her no matter what. And Jesus acknowledges that she's given now more than all the contributors to the treasury combined. Just by giving these two copper coins. What, what, what was she giving to complement these two copper coins? What else was she giving to blow Jesus' mind and for him to be so impressed. She was giving an enormous amount of faith. She was supplying and complimenting this gift with an enormous amount of faith. And this is what gets Jesus' attention. You see, faith is God's currency. It's not the Benjamin. It's not the Jackson. It's not the Washington. It's not the Jefferson, but it's faith that gets Jesus' attention. And the most important aspect of faith is the worthiness of the object that we're putting our faith in. The fact that she was putting her faith in God and God alone to take care of her. And so what we have to understand is that we have something far more valuable than money to contribute. We have faith. And oftentimes we shortchange ourselves because we think if we don't have money to address the situation, we cannot do anything else. 
But no, you have something far more valuable. You have faith that complements your money. And if you're not mixing in faith with what you're contributing to kingdom work, if faith is not a key ingredient or a key requirement to what you're giving, then the text says we're not giving God our very best. Faith must be included in our stewardship. I'm reminded, my brothers and sisters, of what uh, Peter and John did on the road to pray and you know, by the gate called Beautiful. They were, uh, there was a lame man that was lame for 40 years, was begging for alms, and Peter and John didn't have any money to give this man. And many were passing the plate and giving him, uh, giving this lame man money as they went on to pray. But Peter and John, they stop and they fix their gaze on this man in Acts 3. And what do they say to him? They say, silver and gold, I do not have. But what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, rise up and walk. They said, I don't have money to give you. But I do have something far more valuable than money. I have the name of Jesus. And many of us, my brothers and sisters, sometimes we use money to mask our unwillingness to share our faith with others. Say, so I won't go to that faraway country and, and evangelize but I'll put some money on the situation. I won't share with my neighbor down the street my testimony, but I will help them out with a few bucks. We have to make sure that faith is always a part of our stewardship. Sharing our faith is a key ingredient. And so we must be willing to do this and we must be willing to do it wholeheartedly. Uh, verse 43 says, this poor widow put in more than all the contributors to the treasury, for they all put in out of their surplus, but she out of her poverty put in all she owned, all she had to live on. In other words, she gave sacrificially. We see giving God our best requires that we give sacrificially. Jesus was impressed not by the size of the widow's gift, but that she gave out of her poverty, believing that God would take care of her. Uh, even though she had no requirement to give. You know, Jesus knew that this woman was modeling just how God gave to us in sending Jesus. You see, God, he could have given out of his surplus. He could have given out of his abundance when he tried to save us. But he knew that none of that would have bridged the gap between us and God. None of that would have erased and eradicated our sin. He could have given, given us wealth and popularity and spheres of influence. But none of that was an antidote to our sin. So what did he have to do? He lowered himself. And he offered his only begotten son. So if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. I'm so glad that God didn't withhold Jesus from us. Amen. I'm so glad that he didn't withhold his very best from us. So we might have the right, the opportunity to inherit the things of God. In the same way, we must be willing to sacrifice. Because it models for everyone how God sacrificed for us. And we must do a heart assessment. Where were you before you met Jesus? Where were you before you were introduced to him? Where are you now in your relationship to him? And we must be willing to say, Lord, we trust you with everything you've blessed us with because we know where our help comes from. Then third, giving God our best requires that we show gratitude for God's grace. This widow didn't give out of compulsion or vanity. 
but she gave out of gratitude for God's grace in her life. You see, she, she was uniquely positioned as a widow to receive all the benefits of the temple. There were laws protecting her. She was protected in every aspect of her life because of her status in society. And she had confidence that she could draw from the temple each and every day her daily needs. She was grateful for what the temple was able to do for her. And in the same way, God is our source for everything. And just like this woman, we are uniquely positioned as a believer to receive the benefits from God each and every day. David put it, David put it like this, I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging for bread. Because of our status in God, the scripture says, eyes have not seen, ears have not heard. Neither has it entered to the hearts of men the things that God has prepared for those whom he loves. Because of our status in God, the scripture says, no good thing will I withhold from those who walk uprightly. Not only must we have gratitude for God providing us our daily needs, but we must have gratitude for God saving us from our sins, for picking us up from where we were, canceling out an enormous debt that we could not pay. The wage of sin was death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. The wage of sin was death. And the greater the debt the greater the gratitude we should have. Think about that. The greater the debt, the greater the gratitude we should have. I'm reminded, my brothers and sisters, of this time when I was a practicing lawyer in, uh, here in Southern California. I was representing a small hotel franchise, and uh, they had gotten in some trouble, gotten into some enormous debt that they could not repay, and they asked me to come and help them in court, get this debt lifted off of their books. And I was able to find some loopholes in, in the debt and the contract. And I was able at the end of this two-year period, going back and forth in court, to have this enormous debt taken off their books. And they were, they were grateful for that. They said, Courtney, thank you. And if you ever need a free hotel stay, you ever need to stay at our hotel and if you're in Los Angeles you need a free hotel stay you can stay here free of charge I said wow that's really great and I decided to take them up on that offer a couple times when I would have to be in court early in the morning in Los Angeles I didn't want to drive up from Temecula first thing so I go up the night before and after a couple times of doing this I started to feel kind of guilty I said you know I feel kind of guilty not offering you something for this. Can I pay you something for this hotel? He said, Courtney, you don't understand. An enormous debt was on our books, let alone the aggravation and the stress. Can you just take this as a token of our appreciation, of our gratitude for what you were able to accomplish for us? And that really resonated for me. The greater the debt, the greater the gratitude we should have. I'm so thankful that I had a debt that I could not repay. We all had a debt that we could not repay. But God in his grace and in his mercy, he looked beyond every fault every mistake, every debacle. He looked beyond every sin and he saw our need for Jesus. He canceled out our debt. And for that, we should be grateful. As I close, I'm reminded 
of this story in the Bible, in Luke 7 and 40, where Jesus captures this, this principle of giving, of being grateful. And he does this by inviting a sinful woman into a Pharisee's house, Simon the Pharisee. In Luke 7 and 40, he invites this woman, and this woman has been living a sinful life, promiscuous and had loose living, but Jesus graciously forgives her, shows her enormous grace. And this woman who is overwhelmed with gratitude for the grace that Jesus has shown her, she begins to weep at Jesus' feet. She pulls out an expensive bottle of perfume, begins to anoint Jesus' feet and wipe his feet with her hair. And the Pharisees are looking down on this woman, saying, if he knew, if Jesus knew just how sinful this woman was, he would not have invited her to this place. But Jesus, discerning the hearts of the Pharisees, speaks to, speaks to them in this parable, in the gospel according to Luke. I'm going to read this into your hearing. It's this parable of the two debtors. It says, a money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they were unable to repay, he graciously forgave them both. So which one of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, you have judged correctly. Turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. But she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but she, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she anointed my feet with perfume. For this reason I say to you, her sins, which are many, <laughs> have been forgiven. For she loved much. But he who is forgiven little, loves little. You see, Jesus replied, I know her sins are many, but I have forgiven her. And she understands the depth of my love for her. She knows the greatness of her sin. And she knows how much I'm willing to reach beyond her sin to save her. And because of that, she's able to lavish upon me this expensive perfume. Lavish upon me her adoration and praise and worship. Because she knows just how far I've brought her from. In the same way, my brothers and sisters, we must, in this principle of giving, do a hard assessment of our debt that we owe. Just how much have you been forgiven? Just how much have we been rescued from a life of sin and degradation? A life that was completely alienated from God. Scripture says we were dead in our trespasses and in our sins. But Christ made us alive because of his richness of mercy, because of his grace. We now can stand as a child of God. And because of that, we can now lavish upon him our praise, lavish upon him our worship, our adoration. He deserves all the glory and honor and praise because of what he's done in our lives. Aren't you glad about it today? Amen. That God so loved us that he rescued us from where, our, where we were so we might be on a right path to serve him. And for that, he deserves our gratitude. Let us pray. Father, we're so grateful for all that you've done We don't take it for granted, the debt that we owed. We don't take it for granted, the journey that you have placed us on. For looking beyond all of our faults, our sin, and seeing our need for Jesus. Lord, we thank you for wiping away every sin and pla placing us on a path of righteousness. 
We were not worthy, but you made us worthy. We thank you, God. And because we thank you, God, we're going to not sit on our praise and our worship. We're not going to sit on our time, our talents, and our treasures. But we're going to give it to you because you own it all. We love you and we thank you for this word today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Clear to all of us that are present. As God's word has so graciously and so brilliantly been presented to us. Now the question that I have for you, and even for myself, is what will we give God? He gave his very best for us. So what, what will we give? What will we personally and individually do? I don't know where your heart is with God. I can't tell. You know, you don't have some magic thing that appears. Only you know where your heart is and what your relationship with God is like. So I want to give you the opportunity to give the very best that you have. The very best that you have is your heart. So in just a few moments, and the, the band's going to, the worship team's going to bring this, this song to us. And Ed's standing here, Daniel's standing here. I'm going to ask you all to stand in just a moment, not right now. I'm going to ask you, how will you respond? What will you give? All you simply have to do to say to the person next to you, if, you, if the desire of your heart today is to give your heart to Jesus, just tell them, excuse me, and step down the aisle. Come down here, let us pray with you. To accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Maybe today you're saying, you know what, Pastor, I'm already there. I've already given my life to God. But Brother Courtney said something interesting in the message. We have a tendency to give parts. And maybe you've given six parts. Well, I'm here to tell you today there's seven. There's one part that you haven't given. We need to give it all. And then lastly, if you say, well, pa Pastor, I've, I've given initially, I've, I've given all that I can think of. Maybe you need someone this morning just to pray with you. To examine your life. Not to, not to judge you. That's not what we're going to do. We're, we're here to pray with you. Because here, let me just share my heart. My heart today is that we need to be, and I shared this with the ministers this past week. We need to be intentional in the decisions that we make. Not casual, not lackadaisical, but intentional. If you want to have a close relationship with God, you have to be intentional about it. You need to let him know that's what you want. And we're here this morning to pray with you about that decision. So don't leave here today saying, I want to be closer. I want a closer walk. Come up here. Let us pray with you about having a closer walk. And this is what I'll promise you. We'll walk alongside of you to make sure that your walk draws closer to Jesus. Amen. Let's stand together. And this, let me just share with you, I'm going to share as I, um, and I'm surprised, well, no, I mean, just, our, 
our text for our offering today. It's going to sound like it's familiar. Maybe it's in your, if you look in the bulletin. It's from Luke chapter 21. The first four verses from that chapter. And listen to what, it, what Dr. Luke wrote. As he, that's Jesus, looked up. Jesus saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. And he also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. I tell you the truth, he said. This poor widow has put more in than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth. But she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. Amen? Now, let me just, I, I work, Jeanette and I worked together to put together the worship service map before we found out from Minister Courtney what his text was and the subject of the message. So here's the thing, you know, and I, and I know you all know this. When the Bible says verily, verily, that means attention, attention. You need to pay attention to what comes afterwards. So we just got to verily, verily. Amen? Because he used the same text. Out of, yes, it was out of Mark, but it's the same story in Mark as we read in Luke for our offering. So verily, verily, we need to give our best. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you again for the privilege that we have to continue our worship by giving. In these envelopes, Lord, we hold a portion of what you have given us. But Lord, as we clearly know and have learned today, all that we have is yours. You've called us to be faithful stewards of your resources. So as we give, we give for the upbuilding of your kingdom, not only here at Meridian and in El Cajon, San Diego, California, the United States, and throughout the world. We thank you for the privilege that we have to be a part of a network of churches. Truly a network of fellowships that are planting churches and sharing the gospel around the globe. We literally, Lord, have placed people in harm's way. And so humbly we ask that you would put a hedge of protection around them, keep them from any hurt, harm, and danger. And then, Lord, we pray that you would open up a window in heaven and pour out a blessing that we know has truly come from you. We thank you for the answer to our, our recent grant requests. Lord, that it was favorable and we will have funds to, to replace some of our older equipment and our food distribution ministry. Thank you, God, for, for opening that door and for that, um, that blessing. May we, in fact, Lord, use the resources to reach people intentionally with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we ask this in the precious and mighty name of Jesus with joy, thanksgiving, and forgiveness of sin. Amen. Amen. So, Minister... Ed and Pastor Gary are going to come forward here, and uh, they're going to come by with a offering basket so that you all don't have to get up. Bobby's coming. Bobby's going to help. Okay. Come on, Bobby. You may have noticed uh, this morning that David isn't with us. Um, David is... Uh, David's in the hospital in the um, Huntington Beach area. He messaged me last night. Uh, he was, his blood pressure was over 200. And so they uh, were working on him to get his blood pressure down. He messaged me again about 2.30 this morning and said his blood pressure had come down. It was only 150. Uh, but it was 150 over 50. So um, I don't know if he's still in the hospital now, but just keep him in your prayers that he would get well. I told him rest and that we would pray for him. And I'd let you all know where he was and what was going on with him. 
So, uh, all right, Bob. Good to see Bobby, the best dressed man at Meridian Baptist Church. Amen. Bobby Walker. All right, Charlene. Well, after the service, or maybe following service, the estate planning seminar is today. I believe it's going to be in the fellowship hall. Okay, fellowship hall. All right, moving on. And then we have our community dinner on Wednesdays. We're no longer uh, drive through. We're actually be able to sit down and um, commune together. So that's a beauty. And that's this Wednesday. And then also Thursday, every Thursday, unless said otherwise, we have this one is a drive through. So you're going to get your food and kind of drive through out of here. So that's the food distribution. <laughs> Sorry. That's the field of food distribution every Thursday at 4 o'clock. If you want to come and help volunteer with that, please call the church and they can let you know what time to be here for that. And then lastly, the Father's Day luncheon. Yay! All right. So that is Saturday, June 17th at 1 o'clock here at the church. The cost is $15. You're going to see Minister Ed and Pastor Gary to get more information about that and to buy your tickets. Yeah. All right? All right. Pastor, tag here. Pastor Ben? Pastor Ben would... Um, you know, You can lean on me. Offering my hand, he just kind of yeah. lean on me. We just have a full believer every week. But I believe the gospel every week too. Amen. 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 <laughs> I, I write a this book, a list of paper, about the 5,000 public in, in San Diego. And this, I write 1,400 or six. Wow. Here. This is so what Pastor Ben is this newspaper in case you didn't get this, this newspaper has distributed five thousand copies throughout San Diego and he has written this article that is in here from him is his one thousand four hundred and sixth article. Amen. And out after pay sixty dollars. For this day. Okay. Six, every week? Yeah. Yes. Amen. Yeah. And, and, and before I drive easy, about the one day or two day, I make it. And now I need to drive a full day, five day. <laughs> <laughs> and I think the pastor and support, a pastor and doctor support me by prayer. And now you pray for God. Excuse you, me. Oh. How, and how, many, how many books now, Pastor Ben, have you completed? 122. Amen. So he's written 122 books. And um, the, the, the poor room for the poor with this book, and you go to New York and join the people. What's that? Amen. 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 Pastor, Pray Pastor, for me. Pastor Ben told me this, this morning that he wasn't, he wasn't feeling well. And so he's asked for us to pray for him. Yes. So could I ask uh, some of our men if you would come and gather with us and gather around him? Um, you know that we do this. Thank you. Support me, I pray. Yes. Amen. Yes. Let's all get around him. <laughs> Lord Jesus, we thank you for the many blessings that yes. Pastor Ben has spread around the world. Yes. We yes. pray that you give him the strength to continue the blessings that you've given mm -hmm. to his people and our people. This we Amen. pray in Jesus' name. 
Yes. Father God, first and foremost, we're just so grateful to you, but we thank you so much for this dear pastor, your, your dear servant, who has not only blessed this church, this city, but he had, you have allowed him to bless people around the world. We ask you to touch him from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet and give him a complete healing. Build him up where he needs to be built up. Give him strength where he needs to have strength. And continue to Amen. please use this dear brother as you Amen. see fit. We say this in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, would you touch him, touch Pastor Ben from the crown yeah. of his head to the sole of his feet. Yeah. Allow him to experience your healing. If it be your will, God, touch him right now. Mm -hmm. Let him have a testimony of how you've strengthened him. Mm -hmm. Encourage him to encourage others as he walked this journey, Lord. Yes. We pray this in Jesus' name. Yes. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father, for we know that you have blessed Pastor Ben with a yes. gift to communicate. And as he has written over 122 books, yes. 122 books and over 1,400 articles. And Lord, we know that his desire is to continue to serve you, to yes. write more books and to write more yes. articles. And so we pray that you would give him physical strength. Yes. yes. But also, Lord, we pray that for his mental acuity, that you would keep him sharp. Lord, yes. So that he can uh, produce the works that you have for him. Mm -hmm. There are many things in his mind that need to be said and need to be documented and written yes. out. And so I pray, God, that you would just give him the physical strength that he needs to continue this work. It's in your mighty and precious name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 And as I say, in, in this country, I learned the English, and my people say, know God, and oh God. But I say I share to them how to know God. K S O W. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Pastor Pastor Ben is such a blessing. He is uh, he's a pastor amongst pastors around the world. Um, I, I we've had we've celebrated many of his anniversaries um, from, you know, his 40th year in ministry, his 45th year, soon coming his 50th year. And when we talk about, when you talk about ministry, his ministry crosses denominational lines. I was, I was amazed last time we had a celebration for him. Um, one of the speakers was a Catholic priest now, this is, he's an evangelist. I'll just tell you right now. He's an evangelist. I don't speak Vietnamese, but I've heard him preach, and I can tell when he's just laying it down. I mean, Courtney, I mean, he's just, he's just sawing some serious, you know, lumber. He's laying down the word of God so that people will know. He's not intimidated. I mean, his, his little pamphlets and things, he writes, he's written about uh, the difference between belief in Buddha and a belief in Jesus and you know he's it's just gone out everywhere but this Catholic priest was here and stood here in the pulpit and talked about he had ordered some of Pastor Ben's tapes and and that he was studying those and I was all I could think of having been well anyway I, I, was, I was just thinking boy better not let the word get to the Vatican about this <laughs> That guy will no longer be a priest, you know, because not only did he want, not only was he talking about having Pastor Ben's tapes, but he also had Pastor Ben's outlines. Oh, wow. And so the tapes and the outlines, if you know he's an evangelist, you know where that's going to lead. It's going to lead to the cross. It's going to lead to faith in Jesus. Yes. And so uh, I'll just say he was a, he's a born again Catholic priest. Amen. <laughs> Brother Courtney, thank you so much for, for sharing a, a word. I, I just know, I know that you probably, well, I, I won't guess, but um, when, when 
I, I can tell you that when the message that's proclaimed at Meridian goes, I guess the term would be goes over or lands, it gets quiet. And I know that in some churches it gets loud with a lot of amens. When you're stepping on toes, we don't even say ouch in here. We, we, just, we just get to shuffling our feet in the seats, you know. So I'm sure today we were shuffling our, our feet in the seats. And we were truly blessed by the word of God. Um, we're going to take a few moments to set up in the fellowship hall for um, the estate planning seminar, and then uh, I think that's going to be at, what, 1230. So we got about 10 minutes, uh, 10, 15 minutes to get things ready. So we'll do that, and then uh, Brother Courtney will be sharing uh, estate planning. So let's, let's stand together. Lord, what a, a tremendous day this has been. We thank you for how you have blessed us, how you have spoken through your servant today how you have knitted this worship service together from weeks ago, the beginning of the week, to put, to put together the same story to be used as a reminder to us to give our best. And so, Lord, we are thankful for what you have done, what you have given us, and we pray, Lord, that you would once again Bless us and keep us and make your face shine upon us and be gracious to us. We pray that you would lift up your countenance upon us and give us peace. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.